because I was willing to do to sacrifice everything for promotion and for more money and more power and position, we moved 21 times in 18 years. Not because we couldn't pay the rent or anything else. It was just if somebody offered me a couple thousand more bucks and a chance to move up a little bit with the company, I didn't check with you. I didn't check with nobody. I said yes and just packed you up with the kids and away we went. By the time I, I was 21 years old, we had moved 18 different, I mean, I was 18, we moved 21 different times. That's a lot for a girl. You can't make a friend like that. You can't have spend the night parties of that. We moved constantly. Uh, I knew, I knew that, that, that I was doing things that were wrong, but I was doing them anyway. And I, I, had, I had lied to myself about, about who I was and what I had become for so many years. It, what, it didn't impact on me on a daily basis. Uh, I was able to put it out of my mind, so to speak, because to deal with it would have been too painful, actually, you know? So I put, I put all the mistakes I'd made and all the terrible things I'd done out of my mind, basically. And I could not believe what was happening to the family as far as my, my sisters, but also I couldn't believe this thing that was regurgitating inside of me, and it was incredible. Um, and uh, thankfully, all I can get, all I can, I'll, whenever, whenever uh, my sister Susan, she looked at me whenever I was getting rug burns on my face because my face was just buried into the ground and the carpet of her house, uh, upstairs in her house. I, I, I just, she just said, she thought probably I was upset over them, you know, the abuse, but it, it wasn't that. It was, it was everything hitting me. And, and then she says in such a kind way, you know, did it happen to you? And then that's when we found out about the scope of the situation. Because we really did, we really did, because again, no one was talking about it, so we just, it just never crossed our radar. Uh, your mom got a call from Virginia, our oldest daughter, and she said, we need to have a meeting, we need to talk. They called her over there, and they confided in her that I had been abusing y'all, in addition to my alcoholism and all the other terrible things I did, I'd also been abusing y'all as you children coming up. I was blindsided. I had no clue, and no clue, and, and I couldn't comprehend it. And so I'll never forget that. I was waiting in my apartment uh, in Meridian, Mississippi, and it was just me and uh, my uh, husband then, and we were waiting on, on uh, Asa to come. And... And, but I knew that I had a, I knew I had to get the game on. I knew I had to put the gloves on because there was an enemy. I did not know then what I know now that the enemy was not my father. The enemy was Satan and all of these principalities and powers. And I can remember just feeling so sick. I remember my older sister driving up and having my other older sister Tammy on the phone and explaining to her what was about to happen. She was actually in a whole other country. Days We have no cell phones. I don't even know how she got a hold of me. Uh, but she got a hold of me and told me it was going down. And I was very, um, I don't know, I was hugely devastated. I was crying, I was hysterical. I had to tell my friend what the situation was going on. But I was getting my game face on. It was like in the locker room of a, of right before the football game, you know, whenever you're hitting the pads. I mean, that's the feeling that I had because I knew something had to be different. Uh, Asa showed up and was pumped up and ready and he was just, you know, I, in my mind, I can remember thinking this is the end of our family. But there was just something about the, the hope that was in his eyes and just the uh, excitement that this was not the end. That something was going to happen today, but it was not going to be the end of it. I felt like it, was, it wasn't happening. I wasn't ready for it to happen because I hadn't prepared myself. I hadn't prepared my family. I, didn't, I just didn't feel like I, we were ready for that to happen. So I was not, I was not happy. Because I had to think to myself, this is what tragedy looks like. This is what tragedy looks like. We're fixing to go in and disown a person that has been a part of our life for, for our forever, right? Has been a part of our life. And I was sitting directly across from my, mo my mother and my father. And um, I can remember just feeling the weight of the pain that was in that room, looking at my mother, looking at my dad, and uh, you know, 
any child, no matter what you go through with your parents, you still, that's still your mom and dad. You still love them and you still, you know, want to be in their life. And just knowing the weight of that moment uh, was very heavy. Everybody, as everybody knows in my writings or in our testimony or anything else, uh, y'all were done with me. It was, it was, it was we were over. Uh, I didn't really realize at the time, although I do realize now, that y'all probably felt like y'all were over as a family, even, that y'all as brothers and sisters, y'all probably just gonna go your separate ways and never look back up your show at it again, you know, start a new life. Uh, we began to go around the table one by one, discussing some things and really just charging my father with the, uh, with the, the crimes that we believed he had, he had uh, committed. And I start giving him accounts of what he did. Evidence that demands a verdict, right? Evidence that demands a verdict. And the second, the second that I was through with that, mom turns to him and says, you know, after 35 years, 30 years of marriage, you know, I'm through. And so <coughs> everybody says, I'm done. And then it's over. Uh, I can remember just getting up from that moment, realizing and knowing we would never be the same again. I, when I got up from that table, I knew it was over. It was over. There was no doubt in my mind about it. Uh, and so I just went and packed my stuff up, as you well know got in the truck and just took off. I mean, there wasn't anything else for me to do. That's what I was told to do. I had no excuse for the way I lived my life and what I'd done. Um, and so it was the best thing for me to, to get out of the way and do what y'all had asked, if that would help in any way. Then I had a phone conversation with Dad, basically saying, uh, you suck, uh, I'm gonna have the most awesome life ever, ever anybody ever had, and you will not be a part of it. When a bomb explodes like it did that day, you have to really sit back and wait for the plume to drop and to, to come on down before you can really do anything. And I think that's what we did. We were all surrounded by amazing mentors very quickly on who took us under their wings and, and mentored our hearts and loved us and taught us how to be human beings. I didn't even really know how to be, you know, uh, a human being. I just knew how to be a survivor. That's all I knew. It was hard, it was painful. Was, you know, you want to vomit and throw up, but those things have to happen. It's through the pain there's the promise, right? That I, I realized that when you're hurting so bad, you're, you're like in a box, and then you find something, which I found Jesus at that time, then he lets you out of the box, and he really says, give it to me, trust in me, and I'll make it better than it was. I'm kind of of the mind of, oh, they're just hiding behind this whole Jesus thing to kind of, oh, I'm all forgiven, I'm okay. Because again, I'm not living there day to day. I don't see the changes and see the, the humility and the I've done a wrong thing and I don't see the actions behind the words. So I'm just kind of like, oh yeah, you do whatever. You go let Jesus be your savior. <laughs> it don't matter to me. And mom was cooking something in the kitchen. And I remember just feeling so bad because she looked like she was days away from death. I knew what was happening, but I could not do anything about it. That's what my thought process was. And that's so many people believe that, that I can help me, but I can't help anybody else, you know. And, and now whenever I talk to people, I'm like, you're the hands, you're the feet, you're the mouth, you're the eyes, you're the ears, all right? You're the body of Christ. Of course you could do something. You were eating lunch, and uh, you asked me, was I saved? And, and so I go, uh, and you said, you hesitated. He said, we got to get this, this done because I want to see you paradise with me. I'm telling you, days away, eyes sunken back in her head, really black around her eyes, very scathed appearance. Uh, and, and I said, Mom, I said, Jesus Christ loves you. 
and he wants the best for you. And I just remember the Spirit of God just coming into that place and he ministered to her. I don't remember all that I said, but I knew she hit her knees. She hit her knees. Never saw my mother pray, hit her knees, cry out to God, and she was doing all that at the same time. Freaked me out, man. And so I knelt down beside her and we wept and she asked Christ to come into her heart and renew her. Blew me away. She's a little, little bucko five soaking wet, probably 80, 80 cents soaking wet. Gets up, starts running around the house talking about praise Jesus. Never heard it. I never heard Jesus come out of her mouth except for a cuss word, right? Here's a 52-year-old man that I would know something, you know, <laughs> sitting on a sofa across from a 22-year-old kid who's the son he has abused and misused, okay? Who's still demonstrating love to him in spite of that and, 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 and have, have words come out of his mouth that are way wise beyond his years. That no way any 22 year old would be saying the things that, that you were saying and, and giving me the insights that you were giving me in that moment. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to me that night and showed me the answer to what I was looking for. The, the answer was, I needed to get on my knees and I needed to indelibly place Christ into my heart and life forever. Spirit of God came in that place. I can't explain it. All I know is that we found ourselves both on the floor and he was on his knees and, uh, and here I was leading him to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. I think he had already made the decision that there needed to be something different. He just needed to be, it's low hanging fruit, he just needed to be walked in, in, that, in that general direction. And I can remember coming over one day to their house and I drove up into their driveway. And when I drove up that day, something was very different. My dad was on a ladder painting a house. And the thing that was so amazing about that is A, my dad was on the ladder painting a house, but he was painting the house the color that my mother chose. And he is, I gotta say, my mother and father have not stopped walking that direction since that day. There, there was no, there was no, let me think about this. And I believe it's because they realized they lost everything. It was, they crucified their family on the altar of self-centered, selfish lifestyle. And so they knew everything that was at stake. The line had been drawn and they crossed over it. And they, from that point forward, I have never seen my father or my mother not fight this good fight of faith. whoever's listening to this uh, presentation, for goodness sakes, get yourself free if you're not free through Jesus Christ. Experience His love and His healing power in your life. And then once you are grounded in that for sure, you know you're solid in your relationship with Him, go find somebody else that's hurting and give them that same living hope that has been given to you by somebody you have to remember there's no script to any of this. There's absolutely no script. And so if there's any way to remember your why, of why you're a family, of why you're together, to kind of separate yourself from the pain and not take the personalness in it so much, it helps you just to be able to sustain it. But the second thing is this, everything in life is hard. Everything is gonna to try to take you out. Everything is going to try to come against you, but I believe it is the heart that makes it great. I genuinely do. You can't fix yourself and help stop these addictions on because you want to get back a relationship, your boyfriend, your husband, your kids, and yes, those are all important things and you're trying to rebuild your life, 
but that's why you can't you can't do it for them you have to think I'm a great person and I deserve a better life than what's happening right now that I'm walking because once you are filled up and you know you can stand on your own two feet then you can go to these other people and ask for forgiveness or whatever but if that's all you're waiting for is to get that back it's just not gonna happen you've got to do this for yourself because you deserve it you deserve to be a whole person and to fill yourself up because if you're still empty you can't there's nothing you can give to them so you got to do that for yourself first be selfish and do it for yourself first don't let it own you because you've been purchased it won't own you anymore if, if you realize you've been purchased. Jesus owns me, right? God owns me. He made me. He owns me. This watch, right? Right? It was made. The creator owned the watch until I purchased it. Now I own the watch. I know who owns me. And what the world says that I am, that doesn't own me anymore. What had happened to me, is, is history, and I learn from it, but it doesn't own me anymore. So as you methodically go through and you get help and you get perspective and you, get, and you surround yourself with a healthy environment, know who you are and whose you are and what's rightfully yours and go after it.